Yeah, I think you should try to straighten that out because yeah. that's your main medium, right? Yes, yeah, so I just uh, sent a message to someone who's an expert in this. Inshallah, she can help us out. Um, Okay, inshallah it says it's working, so mm. alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So alhamdulillah, happy to see everyone again by Allah's grace. And uh, lovely weather outside, yes. you know, yeah. subhanallah. This Ontario fall is stunning. Mm -hmm. I heard so much about it for 30 yeah, it's so years. Beautiful. So beautiful. In the West, it's not uh, like this. Mm. The West is not as spectacular as mm -hmm. this, so we used to always hear about the Ontario Falls. So, Alhamdulillah, very lucky to witness it, mashallah. Uh, so, we'll make dua basmala, inshallah, and we'll start, inshallah. Wa billahi min ash-shaytan Ya Rabbi, Ya Rahman, Ya Hanan, Ya Manan, Ya Dal Jalal, Ya Ikram, Ya Quddus, Ya Samad, Ya Wadud, Laysa Kamithu Li Shayin Wa Hubsan Wa Basir. يا أحد يا قهار يا واسع يا جبار يا متكبر يا الله أنت الأحد ولم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد يا قابل يا باسط يا الله والله يقبض ويبسط وإليه ترجعون يا نافع دار يا أنا إنما النجوى من الشيطان ليحذرنا الذين آمنوا وليس بدارهم شيئا إلا بإذن الله وأنا الله فليتوكل المؤمنون يا منتقم يا تواب يا الله ربنا وجعلنا مسلمين لك ومن ذريتنا أمة مسلمة لك وأرنا مناسكنا وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم يا رحمن رحمتك وسع كل شيء يا رحمن عجل يا رحمتك يا رحمن رحيم يا مؤيز يا مديل يا رحمن وتؤيز من تشاء وتذل من تشاء يدك الخير إنك على كل شيء قدير يا مؤمن يا مان يا رحمن لله ما في السماوات ولا بإن الله هو الغني الحميد يا أيها الناس وأنتم الفقراء إلى الله والله هو الغني الحميد يا رزاق يا مطيب يا رحمن من يشفع شفاءة حسنة يكون له كفء نسيب منها ومن يشفع شفاءة سيئة يكون له كفء منها وكان له على كل شيء مقيتا يا فتاه يا وهاب يا رحمن فعلم ما في قلوبهم فأنزل السكينة عليهم وأثابتهم فتحا قريبا يا قدوس يا سامد يا ودود كل نازله روح القدس من ربك بالحق وليثبت الذين آمنوا وهدى وبشرى للمسلمين يا أحد يا سامد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد واستغفروا ربكم ثم توبوا إليه إن ربي رحيم ودود وهو الغفور الودود ربنا إنك تحب العفو فإنك تعفون كريم تحب العفو فاغفر عنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انقذ منا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورأينا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من فوقنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من تحتنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عن أيماننا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عن شمائلنا نحن أدو إليك على بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا رباه يا رحمن يا الله Alhamdulillah, mashallah, so it's a blessing to be together again. Um, so today, you know, we were following the tafsir of Surat Maryam, and we came to a point where we said, uh, everyone has a word, uh, that when Allah creates us, uh, the difference between uh, you know, when Allah breathes the ruh into us, He breathes with it uh, something that we uh, have to achieve and have to do because that's the that's the purpose of our coming to this dunya. And uh, I don't know if you were here, but before we talked about the five stages the soul goes through uh, or the, the, the human being goes through. The first is, of course, the initial phase, uh, our life in heaven. Then our life uh, in our mother's womb, then our life in dunya, then the barzakh, uh, and then our eternal life that we go back to. And bi'idnillahi ta'ala, all of us will go back to where we came from, which is heaven. So of these phases, of course, the time in the, in the womb is very short. Um, 
but the dunya period the the time you have life on earth is uh is the most critical and also very one of the shortest periods um and it is this dunya period and the difference between uh, dunya and um, other realms we said is that dunya has a lot of mixture dunya is a place of mixture and everything here is mixed right all of us have experienced this uh, whereas the hereafter or akhira or where we came from is not mixed if you are happy if you have happiness it is eternal undiluted no worries no anxieties no what is going to happen tomorrow no end subhanallah so that is the life we came from and that is the life we are trying to remember because the minute we remember that life or the once we attain that memory life here will become very easy right it doesn't mean that life here is going to become paradise because that is not the purpose of dunya and many people misunderstand that and many people have a lot of misery in their lives because they try to make dunya paradise and uh, we try to make it like the home we remember but we we recognize and realize and accept that allah did not create dunya as paradise he created dunya for a certain purpose uh and the purpose is for us to appreciate our lord more because we were given free choice uh, and before we came to earth we we were brought to earth to become the khalifa huh? to have khilafa meaning to be the one who is in charge Uh, to be the one who is going to uh, regulate affairs and set things straight because before he created the human being allah azza wa jalla created everything else and in surah al-baqarah uh, and in uh, various other places this story is given of creation inshallah as we progress we'll have time to go into it but he created uh, first of all the cosmos uh, and then the heavens and the earth um uh, and uh and everything on earth the trees the animals the rocks the stars and all of them he asked them whether they want free choice and they all said no we are content to be what you have made us to be we don't want free will now when the human being came we were asked and we said yes we will accept free choice Uh, and our acceptance of free choice you know some some people say it's because we had hubris hubris meaning uh childish arrogance that we think we can do everything right some people uh, say that's uh, that's one of the reasons for our father adam and his son to fall i don't agree with that um adam alay salam knew allah in a very real way was with allah in the heavenly presence uh, and uh, was given immense honor by allah because the angels were told to bow down to him uh, allah commanded the angels to bow down so Al- adam alay salam and hawa alay salam they knew allah in a very real way so they knew that if allah is giving them this and he has made them and he is giving them this task of coming to earth and being the khalifa it's a tough job allah won't let us down right if allah is saying you go there and you rule the earth and then you come back allah will not leave you to get into trouble this is not our lord our lord looks after us in a in a cherishing tender nurturing way uh, like a father and a mother and both and more <laughs> right subhanallah so allah is not like that so when we accepted free choice we accepted it because we knew that allah won't let us down we accepted it because we knew that we can come here and we can succeed because we have our lord at our back you know and to use a modern phrase he's got our back as the as we say so uh 
if we can tap back into that, Rabbana has us in his hand, he's looking after us. It becomes much easier to undertake and succeed in what you have to do here on, in dunya. If you try to do it on our own, as we often do try, things become very cloudy and difficult. And sometimes the modern education, especially to the to the young, you know, the young people who will listen, inshallah. And I myself, as I'm a prod product of the modern Western education, they try to teach you to be as independent as possible, right? To try to teach you to break down everything uh, that you believe in order to find something new. There is something good in that. There is nothing. There is nothing. You know, it's not completely wrong. But the danger is, if you have no faith, you you can lose your faith. Uh, and and the wrong, what happen? You know, the what we learn wrong is that we think that we have to rely on ourselves to succeed. But our Islamic teaching is not that. It's very different to the modern Western secular education. Our Islamic teaching is to let go completely of our own desires, our volition, everything that is us, so that we become purely a vehicle who is working according to the Lord's instructions. So this is the basis of the Islamic education, which we have lost. The Islamic education pre-modern times um, Again, we teach you to, to, we teach you something different. We teach you to let go of the self so that Allah can take over as Allah intended. Uh, the modern secular Western education teaches you to rely on the self and teaches you that you must uh, gain skills and abilities and knowledge so much so that you can be independent and not rely on other people. Now that's good. But we don't stop there. We say, no, we don't rely on people, but we don't rely on ourselves. We rely on Allah. Right. Uh, that is the difference between an education based on theism or the belief in God versus atheism. The non-belief in no deity. And the modern secular Western education is a pr product of post-Renaissance thinking. This is not the Western education in the medieval times. This is not the way, you know, the people here, the people in Europe, the Gauls and the Franks and the Visigoths and the Anglo-Saxons, all people, traditional people, ancient people understood that there is God. We learn that in the Quran. Allah says, Islam is nothing new. Every single community of people knew there is God. The First Nations people, the you know, we are mashallah on Mississauga land and Ojibwe's and the Cree and in, in the West we call them the First Nations. Every single, and here we are mashallah in our meditation sense, the Buddhist teachings, we consider the, the Buddha to be someone who's enlightened, tapped back into where they came from. Islam tap, happens to be the youngest, therefore the freshest uh, the, and, the, and the easiest to access because it's fresh. But the post-Renaissance period, uh, so we are talking in about four, five hundred years, right? That period, if you study, and I think we should as Muslims, uh, and even non-Muslims, whoever is listening, as people who are living today, we should understand where our educational methodology comes from, right? We train, us, we train a lot in the sciences, I'm a scientist, you know, in medicine, in engineering, in law, but these all technical, these are te technical fields. We, we all understand this is how to take, take some knowledge and apply it. But what really, what really drives society is philosophy. The philosophy that underlies how you teach, what you teach, what you think people should think, so we should understand a little bit about the philosophic underpinnings of the modern world. And when I say, and I, I might say modern Western world, but the modern Western world is what is going all across the globe now. If you go to Sri Lanka or China or 
Malaysia, wherever you go, it is the modern Western thinking that is taking over. And it is destroying our ancient way of living. Right? So some of us, especially, mashallah, you who are, you know, for older generation than me, you're blessed because you remember the ancient way better than I do. I was blessed to grow up in a small village, right? First four or five years of my life in a village with my grandmother, Allah protect her. But if I hadn't had that, it would be very difficult for me because I don't have an experience that I can relate to. So a lot of young people don't have that. And they are so, they have no anchor. When you have no anchor, whatever the storm comes, you will keep going this way and that way, right? Um, the reason we had an anchor was because we believed in a higher power. And the reason all ancient peoples had that anchor is they believed in a higher power. So whether it's the Franks or the Anglo-Saxons or the First Nations or whoever, the ancient people believed in a higher power. They may not have known that higher power well. They may not have understood what God is very clearly. Uh, and this is why the messengers came to clarify that. And we are very blessed to have Allah's own word in our hands so we can understand it the best and the easiest. But they believed in a higher power. So the modern period, post-Renaissance, if you read about the philosophers, uh, uh, I won't mention names because I'm not uh, qualified enough to mention names, but I, I know enough to know that this is something uh, that has certainly a huge uh, effect on our, on our society. Uh, one of the earliest things that happened was the separation of church and state which is now a fundamental strength of the Western democracy. And it is a good strength in a sense, and that happened because of a lot of issues with the church and the way it was run. And the church also, what we mean by the church then is the Roman Catholic Church in the Western tradition. So I'm speaking uh, as not, a, not as an expert, but just to give you a, a sort of a rudimentary understanding. So we have to understand that in the Islamic civilization, in our history, this never happened. There was never a separation of church and state uh, because we can't. With la ilaha illallah, because we are so believing in the unification of everything, we can't pull these two apart. Western democracy, in a sense, is thriving because they pulled it apart, right? Because they didn't allow the church to have an influence so much on how things are governed. So in a sense there was good from that but there's also immense difficulty because now the education system all of this is based on what we call a dichotomy. The separation of belief from practice. For the Muslim psyche this is untenable. We cannot accept that. How can you separate your belief from your lifestyle? Because we often say Islam is a way of life. It is not just things you believe. It is your, your life is based upon your belief. The same for the First Nations people. Everything they do is based on belief. Right? So if they, for example, if they go and pluck some berries, they need to make a herbal tea. They will first thank the bush, take what they need, thank the earth and the air and everything for giving them the bush, never take more and use it for what it is meant for. Muslims are like that. We are forgetting this because we are also now becoming part of the Western a way of education, right? Um, which is the separation. So to go back to the separation, and I, I will mention in our history, also in the Islamic history, we had these great debates. Uh, we had the debates between the philosophers, Imam Ghazali, debated a lot with uh, Ibn Rushd and others because again we had the scientists in our tradition and I myself am a scientist uh, who would oppose the religious institutions because they'll say if you're going to control people's minds so much you are going to prevent them from thinking freely if you prevent them from thinking freely they won't discover it Ibn Haytham, one of the famous scientists who discovered how sight works, uh, he famously said, uh, if you want to discover truth, you must become the enemy of everything you read. Right? 
And this is part of the scientific process. The scientific method is actually very Islamic because we don't accept anything we read unless we have gone by, is this true? Now I believe it, then I accept it. And also in our religious training, it's something very, uh, takes a lot of courage and a lot of parents will never allow their children to do this. But actually in our religious training, if you traditional Islamic training, they will encourage students when they get to 12, 13, you start asking this question, who is Allah? Why do I believe in him? It's encouraged that each person goes through that self question, who is Allah? Why do I believe in him? Who is Muhammad? Why do I believe he is Rasulullah, etc. And then you come to conviction. Unless you go through that and then you find your answers, you won't really believe because you have not tested your faith. Right? Which is why often we find people who enter Islam, you can't shake them. When they enter Islam in a true way, in a sincere way, you can't shake them. No matter what happens to them in life. Because they know what it is like not to have this. As Muslims, we are often very scared, very scared, especially to allow our children to go through this. Because we ourselves don't have the answer to deep questions they'll ask. For example, very common question, if God is good, why is there suffering in the world? Very common question. Hmm? And we'll come to that, inshallah, etc. As Muslims, we say that whenever you see anything around you, any single thing, you cannot accept that it comes from nothing. As a scientist, I believe very much in the existence of a creator because it's part of, for me, this is the logical process. If I see something, I want to know where I came from, how it was made, who made it, who brought it here, who put it here. So I cannot accept the idea that every, something can come from nothing. Even the Big Bang, which I believe in, someone has to have initiated a Big Bang, right? The, something has to have said start. It cannot, we understand in our DNA, I think inherently, that you can't have something come from nothing. Actually, in cell theory, this is one of the rules of cell theory, that every cell it comes from a pre-existing cell, which is very interesting. Um, so though we accept some aspects of evolution, we don't ac accept all of it. Uh, but we are stuck now as Muslims. We don't know. We don't have the tools or the vocabulary to make a cohesive argument as to why we believe what we believe. So I'm, I'm, I'm deviating a little bit, so I'll bring it back to uh, what I started on, which is that once you understand who Allah is, what you're doing here, it becomes much easier to get through your dunya life. Hmm? Yeah. And also in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came and when he experienced Jibrail salam, and when he became a prophet, I mean, the first thing he did is ran to Khadija and he threw himself in her lap and he said, I, he was shaking, he said, cover me, hold me. And he says, I think I've been possessed. I think something has happened to me. I think a devil has come and possessed me because this is so strange. And she was saying, no, look at her faith. Though she doesn't know anything really about faith, she said, no, you are a good person. You have never harmed anyone. You have done good all your life. God won't do this to you. So she knows there is God. And this is why we often say women are able to tap into the unseen, the inner truths far easier than men can. So our heart capacity is much stronger. So we are at a disadvantage in the external world because the way modern society works is based on the brain. Right? It's a very patriarchal society. We are patriarchy, so the male strength of the brain, of reasoning, of intellectualism, uh, of rationality tends to be favored over what is the heart strength. The heart strength is, in a, I wouldn't say irrational, but it is a different type of reasoning. The heart has an intelligence, but the heart intelligence is not like the brain intelligence. The heart intelligence can tap into the unseen, the vibe. Allah far easier than the brain can. 
because the brain is created to understand the mulk, the heart is created to understand the malakut. So she was able to calm him down, though he is the chosen messenger of God and say, no, God won't do this to you. Because your brain says something is wrong with me, this is crazy, I'm going nuts. But your heart says, no, Allah is good, Allah will not do this to me. Right? And then she was able to take him to people who helped him. But it became difficult for him when he, when he encountered the Malakut. So for men, often it's very hard when they encounter the Malakut. For women also, for women also, uh, encountering the Malakut is difficult. For, but, but for men, it's especially hard. So we have to bring back our world into a balance between the male and the female energy. After the time of the flood, after the time of Sayyidina Nuh, uh, according to Islamic spiritual history, many things changed in the world. Before the time of Nuh, salam, <coughs> Adam salam, lived a thousand years. Ahab salam, lived close to that. They were very large people, 30, 40 foot people. So everything was bigger. Obviously, that means intellect is bigger, brain is bigger, everything. And Sayyidina Nuh was of that, uh, Sayyidina Idris who came around that time, and the prophets before. We don't know all of them. After the flood, everything changed. Lifespan shortened, size shortened, intellectual capacity shortened, understanding shortened. So pre-flood and post-flood, they're a bit different in our existence. This knowledge comes from our spiritual teaching. Uh, what was I going to say? Pre-flood, male and female energy was very balanced in the world. Which is why if you go in, if you if you study a lot of the ancient, if you go to the Aboriginal peoples of Australia, actually they have in their oral history a, a story of the flood. The First Nations people have a story of the Great Flood. Right? All ancient peoples remember in their ancestral memory the Great Flood. And they, before then, their male and female energy was very balanced in their societies. They gave equal respect and weightage to the female knowledge as much to the male knowledge. Right? Nowadays, our world, post-flood, we tend to favor the intellect, the rational knowledge, right? the male knowledge more. So it becomes much harder for women. But Traditional societies, like in uh, Sri Lanka, India, and the Muslim world, understood the strength of the female knowledge. And women participated in society and had their say in society in a very different way, right? In a very different way. Not in an external way, but in an internal way. All of you, you, you would have experienced this. Um, now. So that is something we have to work to bring back, to bring back the female spiritual energy into the world because there is an imbalance. And one of the reasons, one of the consequences of imbalance is there's a lot of discordance and a lot of, uh, um, you know, the, the one of the, and when I say male and female, I don't mean men and women, right? These are types of energies because remember we say everything is paired except Allah so Allah has created these and they should be paired in the ancient eastern traditions they call talk about yin and yang a lot right one is akin to the male one to the female but they have to be together and paired otherwise there's imbalance uh, so one of the reasons one of the things that an imbalance will cause is it will cause uh, certainly it will cause anxiety or, or difficulty right? and that will cause a lot of tension and stress. Uh, the male energy if too much is too strong leads to aggression, a lot of aggression, a lot of power, going after power, prestige, recognition, uh, greatness, majesty because we said the male energy is jalal, majestic, it needs all these things or it, it that's its drive, it wants these things. The female energy, if it is imbalanced, tends to be uh, very accommodating, very giving, 
nurturing, loving, kind, but can be abused because of that. Can easily be stepped on and trampled on. So what we try to do is we try to bring every human being, whether you're man or woman, back to the original state of Bashar. Bashar is, is tied to the word uh, Bushra, which is good news, but that is the way Allah intended every human being to be. Bashar is someone who has male and female energy balanced. So if you see such a person, especially the great saints, they are as loving and kind and nurturing with you as your mother. But they are as protective and as strong with you as your father when you sit in their company. You will find both of that in them, whether they are male or female. And very often you'll say when they reach older age, you can't actually say whether this face is a male face or a female face. Whoever of us, mashallah, I've had the blessing to be in their company, you will see that in them. Extremely tender, but extremely strong at the same time. So each of us, we try to get back to being like that. So we have both of these things in us. And we try to bring our society also back to this because right now we are struggling with too much aggression in the world. You know, there's always some war going on. Women will try to prevent aggression as much as possible. Men will try to solve it through aggression. I'm not talking about everyone generally, which is also, mashallah, I talked about in the Quran, in the story of uh, Bilkis, the queen of Sheba. If you read that story um, uh, in a balanced way, Sayyidina Sulaiman, Salam, he knew there was this great queen with a huge kingdom, but she doesn't believe in God. His solution, I will go and invade and make her believe. And he sends a letter, unless you believe in God, I'm going to come and take over your kingdom. She as a woman has the wisdom to say, no, war will always bring difficulty, suffering. We want to avert this wisdom. I will send him a gift and see what he says. He didn't accept the gift. <laughs> and she said, I will go in person. And she went to him. And she met him. And she became Muslim. She accepted what he had to say and her kingdom after her. It's believed that uh, her kingdom is in modern day Yemen. Actually, there's some archaeological evidence to show now that there, you know, the way her kingdom is described in some biblical stories and in the Quran, they're, now they're digging it up and they're finding it. So she averted. Human, immense suffering and, and Sayyidina Sulaiman succeeded and she succeeded so Allah talks about that in the Quran um, so that's one way that we can avert or remove a lot of the imbalance we see especially in the modern western world which doesn't give women it doesn't give the female energy the respect that our traditional societies do. I mean, I'm talking about traditional Muslim societies. I can't speak for others. But traditional Muslim societies, you don't have to be great and so and so with such and such a position to be respected. Sometimes you are a mother, that's enough. <laughs> right? A grandmother, that's enough. Right? Subhanallah. Western societies, that's not enough. What have you achieved? What have you done? How much do you make? Da, da, da. No. We say, no, that's an imbalance. This is not the way we need to, we feel good about ourselves. So for, especially our sisters, our young sisters, they tend to have very low self-esteem these days because this thinking is getting to them because they have no foundation. For, for, those, for you, mashallah, most of, alhamdulillah, I believe all of you, you have that foundation. So this thinking doesn't get to you. But for young people, they don't, so it's difficult. The thinking that everything is based on God. Everything is based on God. This is our way of living. So the environment, our relationship with the environment, our relationship with our family, our relationship with our food, our relationship with our body, everything is based on God. This is the state of the Muslim. So when you remember your previous existence in heaven, Okay, I have been sent here. I have a job to do. I will know what that job is. I will do it. I don't have to do it alone. Allah is always with me. I can check in at least five times a day, but far more than that, maybe all the time. I get my job done. Alhamdulillah, mission accomplished. I'll go back. 
So your life here is very peaceful. It's very... This is Sakina, tranquil. You are satisfied. You have rida. You have satisfaction. It doesn't mean your life is going to be easy or rich or, you know, that you won't have hardship, but you have satisfaction. Right? One day Sayyidina Omar came to the Prophet Ali Salatullah and he said, Raditu Billahi Rabban wa bil Islami Deenan wa bi Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Nabiyan wa Rasulan. He said, I am satisfied. Raditu Billahi Rabban with my, with Allah as my Lord. Will Islam and Islam as my way? Okay, Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and with you, Muhammad, as the messenger and the prophet of God. So this is someone who has come to an understanding. Who am I? What are these things? I am taking it. Right. So you take Allah as your Lord. Allah is your Lord. What does that mean? Allah is your boss. Allah tells you when to get up, where to go, what to do, how to earn a living, whom to marry, how to bring up your children. When you take Allah as your Lord, the world doesn't trouble you so much. Because you know your Lord is the one and only God, the one divine. There's no other power but him. Whatever comes to you in life is your Lord's choosing for you. Right? And you have to respond to it according to how your Lord teaches you to. And he has taught us this. And this is why we have to learn our religion again. And learn from our role model, Muhammad. Right? He gave us a book in which everything is codified. And he gave us an example of how to live that book. Which is why Sayyidah Aisha said, when she was asked to describe Muhammad, he said, she said, he's the walking Quran. So, that, so we cannot divorce the two. Some Muslims, unfortunately, uh, through a lack of knowledge, tend to hold the book but forget the messenger. It's the messenger who teaches us how to understand the book. That is his job. <laughs> that, is why, that is his word. That is why he was created. So if you take him out of the picture, you have this book, but you don't know how to understand it. It becomes very difficult. Um, now... So I want to tell you a little bit because we need to learn this knowledge and our great teachers, this is from Imam Ghazali, about some of the things that happen to us in our thoughts, right? And how we understand where they come from. Uh, we say that you have Nafsani um, Egoistic, we say, and we have shaitani, or we can call that uh, satanic in English, or say devilish. Okay, so lordly, let me just put this in the Arabic first. Lordly, we'll say Rabbani. Lordly. And uh, angelic, we'll say uh, Malakani. These are four of the types of thoughts that will occur to you. So, uh, this is something Imam Ghazali taught us. And we understand, mm, and also write something else here that's very important, the types of self, uh, or let's say, mm, uh, or nafs, uh, in Arabic we say nafs. Okay, so you have Nafsul Amr Bissu, that is the evil commanding self. Nafsul Lawama, this is from the Quran. Um, okay. 
Lawama is sort of self-reproaching, we say. Self-reproaching. <coughs> 